know the particular shape. We're just trying to find it. I've never seen my name in a cemetery. That that's that's eerie. But, uh, wow. Wow. Man, the stories they know, the details they know. I started tracing my roots back when um, Alex Haley's miniseries came out in the mid-70s. This journey that started for me after Alex Haley's min miniseries came out when I was in eighth grade, about to go into ninth grade, um, picked back up 40 years later. My name is Alexander G. Jr. I am 54 years old and I'm a resident of Fitchburg, Wisconsin. We are recording whenever you're ready. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to another exciting podcast episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. I'm a communicator and that's my job, but I do it. Um, as a social activist, as a pastor, as a nonprofit leader, as an author, as a podcast host. So I wear lots of hats, but it really is about communicating a sense of unity and, and hope for society. So give your people strength today. Give your people courage. Turn on a light that someone would realize who you are. I grew up in this community having very good experiences. Um, I delivered newspapers across the street. I was a Cub Scout. You know, I was in this band. I was on homecoming court. So I did the things that Madisonian teens are supposed to do. Because I've benefited so much from the community, I want to do what I can to give, to give back. And I realize my opportunities, my education, my leadership experience um, can't just be used for my own good. I've got to be able to serve the community with it. Some days I feel, I get up and I feel we're making strides. And then the other days I feel like, We've just taken a huge step backwards. I think when I was pulled over by local police twice, once um, in a full black suit, um, and I was told that I fit the profile of a drug dealer, I uh, never forgot those words. I was stopped just two blocks from here, from my church. Second time a few years ago, when the police pulled me over in my church parking lot right at my front door, um, my name's on the sign outside. I'm the most tenured clergy person in this community. And I was asked what I was, what I was doing here in my white, associate pastor, um, person I trained, I signed his checks, was sitting here when I pulled up and was never questioned. He got out of his car and walked over um, to, to my car while I was being questioned. Um, I sat there as the American dream started to unravel in my head, thinking all the things that I was told to do in order to not be in this predicament, to not be confused with drug dealers, um, has just been proven false. I've done all of that for nothing. And I told myself, I'm going to tell of my experiences. Um, and so that was the beginning of Justified Anger. I wrote an article explaining um, I, that I understand the racial disparities. I've lived it. So Justified Anger began to look at how do we mobilize people by educating them on how we got here to this community with such blaring racial disparities. How did we get here? Um, let's solidify that. Let's get on the same page about that. And then what strategies can we take? What steps and actions can we take together, perhaps in different directions, but, but in unison to really bring about change and giving us a sense of hope and moving us beyond apathy and fear of each other. And so I want my story to perhaps make people aware of the, of the American story, American history, to think through U.S. black history differently in understanding, have we really learned history correctly? We're at a critical crossroads, at, at a critical juncture, and um, I want to be a part of a movement that looks at history differently in order to look ahead differently. When leaders, people of color, talk about systemic issues of racism, it's real. It's not just um, folklore, it's real. I'm responsible for helping local residents um, study U.S. black history, particularly non-black allies who want to work in, in, um, in bridging the racial achievement gap here in Madison. We refer to our, um, our participants, our students, as um, would-be white allies. 
because you have to have more than an intellectual experience. Once you've connected this in your head and your heart, and you understand that you have some culpability, some responsibility in doing something about it, that's when it begins um, to become interesting. Most people didn't realize the connection between slavery and what made America a great nation, a powerful nation. And so by, by becoming more aware of how history is put together, they're able to understand how we got to where we've gotten. So, so many things that are playing out in the media today have been happening for 150 years and the white participants had no idea. They just thought black people would just say, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. But I, my heart has been encouraged. Just the fact that you show up and you take this seriously. So thank you. This means a lot to our community. Um, In prepping for giving a talk part, about the horrific nature of slavery, I went to Ancestry.com, typed in my great-great-grandfather's name, Henderson G. I knew his father's name was Reuben Joshua G. And I found a post from an older white gentleman. The post was, was about three years old and basically said, I found out that my great-great-grandfather had a black son. His name was Henderson, does anyone know? Um, anything about Henderson G. Found out that um, this gentleman's great-grandfather and my great-great-grandfather were brothers and found out we were like fourth cousins. So I find this relative, we have conversations, he invites me to New Orleans, and we begin to talk about history and the future. I had to go talk with him in order to answer my own questions. And I wanted to see how he perceived me and, um, and the world and the knowledge that black children and grandchildren were created, were sired by his great, great grandfather. I wanted to meet someone who was a descendant of that um, in order to make the systemic realities of all of that more real and more palpable for me. Oh, and Alex, how are you? Oh, you get a hug. <laughs> it's good to meet you finally. I am John Harkins. I'm a resident of New Orleans, Louisiana, and I have reached the ripe old age of 72. They had a lot of land and they were living the more gone with the wind type life, but the G's really did live that kind of life. Uh, they had the big home and they had the silver that they hid in the well during the Civil War. And uh, they uh, held slaves and uh, it, it's just intriguing to me this new connection here that, uh, that there was uh, Henderson born within this family and right at the same time that uh, Reuben was having his white children, then Henderson was born too. Uh, were there any other brothers, do you know? Or no, Henderson, Henderson was, was the only child. His yeah. mother's name was Venus, but he was the only child that Venus ever had. She was a slave and um, Henderson was a slave. Okay. In order for America to sleep at night, America has romanticized American slavery. That we were on the same um, wavelength and we just lived harmoniously together. By definition of owning chattel property, meant you could get whatever you wanted out of them. Work, lies, songs, sex, children. And so when you think about Reuben um, having a sexual relationship with a slave that resulted in a child in 1847, um, and they had been in the same proximity for years, um, you just understand this was not consensual. You didn't say to your slave owner, not tonight, I have a headache, no means no. There was no me too moment because there was no me. It was just Reuben. It was just white men and black slaves. And so she was raped. Well, the, the clothes, I mean, he's dressed just like Our, the, the white side. Right, the bow tie, the jacket. I think there was an accommodation back then that, that doesn't exist anymore. The day we met was, was so interesting. So I, I walked into John's home with, with all of these expectations and emotions. Later that day, we find out that um, this huge tragedy in Charlottesville was happening the same day. So the country's in this, in this turmoil. Um, and so I want to embrace them understanding they had nothing to do with Venus's rape. My, this is my great, -grand my, this is my great, great, great grandmother. But at the same time, they benefited from slavery and, and, and free labor. But I could just walk in the door saying, 
do you know what slavery has meant to my family? And so I think what's happened as I've reflected back on that initial meeting is that there are things I still want to know about Venus or things I still want to know about how, what they were told about the black relatives and how that came about. But when do you say that? And, and, and when does that come up? And do you build a rapport and then move to the hard spots? And if you start with the hard spots, do you ever build a rapport? So I really focused on connecting because I think truth can come out of a sense of trust and a mutual goal. And if we're in this together, if we're really gonna be family, it means we will have to have some of these tough discussions. When they hear about racial injustice, when they hear things like deconstruction, reconstruction, Jim Crow, what's their, what's their take on the fact that black people weren't really voting readily until the 60s? Um, those are things I wanna know just on their take, knowing that they have black relatives. I know what it's like to meet new relatives. They've always, up until that day, have looked like me. But even though these folks didn't look like me, there was this sense that we're connected. And I don't know how DNA and how blood works, but I, I felt it. I, you know, as much as some days I probably want to deny it because it feels like that's too much, too soon, that's too easy. I, I felt it. I felt that sense of connection with them. I didn't expect to feel that sense of kinship. And I didn't go in wanting to do that because I didn't want a kumbaya moment. I needed a little distance in case I had to ask the hard questions. When he agreed to come to Madison, that signaled to me he wants to be part of a discussion. This racially dysfunctional time within this country, his desire to come here and go on the record talking about how we found each other and what this means um, was something that's very powerful. I wasn't sure that he was going to do that, but when he agreed to and gave me dates, I was really, I was thrilled. Started my life back in high school with the civil rights era. The lynchings that were just so much a part of life back then. There were two of us in our class of 56 who were just rabid racist. We just thought that Ross Barnett was the ultimate. I can remember being called down by a nun in class when I just spewed out some of this, this hate that I'd grown up with. I was challenged by a young teacher uh, who was a real mentor and role model. He challenged me to read John Howard Griffin's book called Black Like Me, which ironically is, is your program That's here. Right, my podcast is I mean, ha how's this for coincidence? And I don't, I don't think so. That. I don't think That's it's wild. a coincidence. It's, it's the way God moves us around on this chessboard of life. If you cross the line, you, you know, you witness these hor horrific events and then you have this change of heart, not knowing that you were going to sit down in the home of a black relative Never and connect. Did. John's an interesting individual. He talked about being very um, anti-black growing up, that he had a black housekeeper. There were, she was called the help. Being able to reflect back on his life and um, the arc of his character development and his understanding of these issues. Uh, I think having an opportunity to sit and talk with a black relative with whom he shares blood. And we found out that we're both G's and Wilders. And so we're double related because my great grandmother was a Wilder and so was his. <laughs> my brother, you know, it's, it's wonderful. So much of this was kept secret uh, through all of my lifetime. Uh, so, I, I just think this is really cool. Let's explore this whole area and see, you know, the true G story. It's a slow process and I've tried to open my white relatives to it. They are just not open, into opening that situation. They're freaking out. They, uh, in general, they're saying, let's just sweep that under the rug. But you know, Alex is a rather big character to sweep <laughs> under the rug. <laughs> That's I mean, right. he's, gonna, he's gonna leave us with a big bump there in Definitely. the rug. And I got a lot of other G's with me too. That'll be a lumpy rug. Yeah, it sure will. I've been estranged, as I told you, from most of them uh, for the last six months or a year. Actually, back to the time that you and I got together. John's basically calling it out and saying, yes, we held slaves and we had domestics and 
you know, and we raped them and we beat them and we sold them. I don't think they wanted that part of their history to kind of come up because then I would probably beg other questions. John's presence did not only give us a chance to talk about the G situation, but it gave us a chance, men of G descent, to talk in a way that America could begin thinking about how do we move forward from this ugly history? And if these folks understanding the ugliness of their past are sitting down in each other's homes, talking about the future, why can't people who aren't related, who weren't owned by the person they're talking to, why can't they sit down and begin to build strategies as well? The potential of doing that um, is what really gripped my heart with John's agreement to come here. That visit uh, when you came down to my house in New Orleans, one of the most exciting things that came out of that day to me was hearing that Henderson and RL worked together on uh, trying to solve this murder case right. and trying to bring the true guilty parties uh, to justice. My great-grandfather and Alex's great-great-grandfather. Uh, so you had uh, Henderson and R.L., which is Robert Lafayette uh, G., who were half-brothers. And after the murder of their sister, uh, we uh, come to find out that um, Henderson and R.L. Uh, had actually worked together. Mississippi. So this is John's great-grandfather, and, and he and, and Henderson were brothers. Wow. This is my great-great-uncle. He's nine years younger. Henderson was his big brother, which makes Henderson um, Reuben's oldest son. Henderson is my great-great-grandfather, so this is Henderson's brother. So John and I are descendants of two brothers. So, I mean, this is Kosciuszko, Mississippi, and, and the blacks and the whites. A hundred and, what, 150 years ago, we're not hanging out singing Kumbaya. But they were still family. That's the part of the story I wish I knew. I'd want him to describe Henderson. I'd want him to tell me what kind of man my great-great-grandfather was, what some of the attributes were of his older brother, I'd want to know um, something about his father and how he how he saw his his black brother. I'd want to know how he how he saw Henderson and Henderson's children. I think that that would be a big question. Um, I'd want to know how torn he was between his own flesh and blood and what society told him about people who looked like Henderson. So I I'd, I'd really want to know how he wrestled with that. I mean. He was a wealthy man, and he inherited that wealth on the backs of free chattel property. And those folks were my family, uh, family members. And so I'd want to ask him about that process and, and what that did to his heart to be related to people um, who also created his wealth. He was a citizen, and Henderson wasn't. He had rights, and Henderson didn't. Henderson was a boy in society, so I don't know to what extent RLG could protect him or stand up for him or defend him. Man, the stories they know, the details they know. Wow. My father used to tell me that his father Ernest, my grandfather, had a white uncle named Thomas G. And I, I couldn't wrap my brain around that as a kid. He said, yeah, you, here, you, you know, Daddy said that he had, um, he had a, a white man as an uncle. There's a Thomas G and a Thomas W. G. Um, this is the Thomas G that started the G grocery store. Hello. Good, good. It's been a couple years, Alex G. But I'm just trying to tell the story about meeting some of my family in Mississippi. My dad built this store here. It's been here 50, 54 years, wow. yeah. My father was born in, uh, I think he was born in Conway. 
and he lived in Kosciuszko. But he moved to Chicago in the 50s. So he and my mother married in the 59. I was born in Chicago in 63. And then they divorced. So I didn't know anything about my G family. Tell all these young people if they have grandparents living when they want to talk about the old times to listen to them because I was one of the many ones that didn't. I wish I had listened too. I wish I had asked more questions. Me too, but I didn't and I regret that. You know, I, I really do because they, they had some stories, you know, and really that there was just so much that I didn't know. You know, just, I'm, like, I'm not kin to them. Yeah, you are kin to them, you know. I, how can I be kin to these people, you know? And, you know, what they say, you know, is really true. You know, you look up and, you know, if, if you're from Lake County or Mississippi, you end up and you are. Hey, you know, I am dating my second cousin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, we're all related. Her openness to talk to us and to be present and to be aware of our family's history was disarming. This is Mike Freeney, by the way, and I don't think we're kin folks. See, that's what we were talking about. She called her cousin James and she said, hey, yeah, yeah, this is Marianne. Some of our relatives are here and they want to see where Ruben's um, burial site is. Can you take them to see it? And she didn't say our black relative. She didn't say there's some black folks who are saying there's some relatives. We're cousins. I don't know how far. You know, but we could figure it out. We are the same relations that John Harkins and I are. Yeah. Because Robert LG is his great grandfather, and he is John Harkins' great grandfather. Yes. And Henderson is James's uncle, and RL is my uncle, because his great grandfather, my great great grandfather, were brothers. We which, get. which meant Henderson has most likely been on this property at Forward some point. Likely. As kids, the black G's and the white G's would play together. I'm sure they and did. And sometimes, like, if outside family came, they'd have to split up, and then the black kids would come to the yeah. back door. This is my granddaddy and great-granddaddy's house. He mentioned that he was raised by his grandfather, and that um, by sitting around the older people, he just heard a lot of the stories. He had a take on why the G house or the plantation home was moved closer to the main street. Um, because the KKK had uh, tried to torch their barn. So he brought a lot of information to light. He was really forthcoming with it. It wasn't like he was hesitant. There must have been doors that the white G's were opening or things they were doing for and with the black G's that would piss the KKK off like that. There's a story of our family making national news because there was a murder that's called, that was referred to in the media as the, as the G. Gamble murder. So one of R.L. and Henderson's sister, her name was Hattie, married a gentleman named Gamble. Um, she and four of her children were murdered, butchered, and the place where they, their home was torched. We actually found um, the burial spot with the names of the four children, Hattie and her four children. And this is Reuben's daughter. Whoa, this is just getting real. What I've heard um, is that um, RLG solicited the help of his brother Henderson to canvass the black community to find out if anyone knows anything about the murder because a black man was found guilty. But the broader community, the white community says that that's not who did it. That was really a white man who did it and they knew, they knew who he was. So yeah, I think they had a relationship. I think based upon what James told us, that's probably why the KKK set their, tried to set their barn on fire. And I think that that's why it's rumored that the KKK has something to do with Hattie G. Gamble's horrific murder. You, you have to uh, understand, uh, if you grew up in Mississippi, I mean, uh, yes, there's some, some crazy people everywhere. Like I said, you know, we're all in this together. We really are. And uh, I can't control my grand my right. ancestors exactly and, and since we've got part of the same set i know you can't control them right, either right but uh we just do the best we can and we move forward and get to know each other meeting with mary ann who owns g grocery store and um and her cousin our cousin um, james hall was really really interesting 
But again, I felt their warmth. The fact that they knew that I was fully a G and they were, was never treated with suspicion. It, it wasn't, well, how could this be? Like, how does this happen? I, I, they knew how it happened. They, they might not have really wanted to press to know the gory details, but the sense that they had a better handle on U.S. history, Mississippi history, pre-emancipation and post-emancipation relationships between blacks and whites, they had a better handle on it than my liberal-minded friends in the North. And I think that was surprising. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, it was just known as G-Town. That's all the G's lived on this segment of the road. Wow. Now, now how, yeah. do we, how do we all get in the same place? Did, did Henderson have land that he gave to his kids? Yeah, or they right, just... yeah, yeah. So he, so he had land? Yeah, all, of my, everybody, all the G's have had their own, own properties. You know, they wasn't no share crops or anything like this. They were land owners. And that's the reason why they call it G-Town. Cousin David, can I, can I get one with you in it too? Oh, sure, man, no problem. I'll stand over here so you're not in the bushes. Man, I grew up in the bushes. <laughs> you grew up in the bushes. For my whole life, I've been trying to um, teach people how to pronounce my name or where it came from. I thought it was Irish, but it's a, it's a Welsh name. But um, seeing land, that my relatives owned, seeing a street named after my family because we owned about a thousand acres. If I had known that information growing up, I would have thought differently about the world. Um, I would have understood that I come from builders, I come from landowners, I come from business folks, and not just what I'm taught in school. I want people to know that they come from great stock and we're more than just descendants of slaves, but we are, um, and we're, we're, we're innovative and we're ingenious and intuitive and productive. And every time I see this sign, it does something to me. Living in a place where your family has name recognition and people know of your accomplishments and you had to have overcome slavery and Jim Crow and separate but equal to own land, a thousand acres and have streets named after you. My family, just a few years after the end of slavery, had acquired or amassed enough land to donate land for the building of a local church, the Center City Missionary Baptist Church. Another relative, his name was G, donated land for the creation of the school district in that part of the country. How do grandchildren of slaves acquire, get the money to acquire land, have enough land to donate it to a church, to donate it for the creation of a school system, and have the freedom to really transact that level of business? Something happened. Um, and it makes me think, it makes me create a hypothesis that there must have been a sense of connection. Although that goes against what I want to believe about slaves and slaveholders and their descendants, there are enough cases of where people um, were given freedom, given resources, particularly the sons and daughters, particularly the sons of slaveholders were given something. I don't know what Henderson was given. I mean, I, this is where I wish I could get in a real time capsule and go back in time. But, um, but I think I have an hypothesis that somehow Henderson and his kids were granted something, bought something, were taught something to become major um, landowners. I found myself wanting to be there. I found myself wanting um, to connect myself to that level of strength, insight, and wisdom of a people who against all hope believed in hope in the future. That's, that's just really empowering to me. Um, I think I would have lived my life differently knowing that that's my heritage. If I had known when I was seven or eight that my family is responsible for the school district in that community, for the religious life in that community, at least for one of the most established churches that I saw, man, that would have, that would have helped me to cope with being one of two black kids in a classroom my entire life. And um, when black history or social studies ended with slavery, I would have raised my hand and said, let's talk about reconstruction. I grew up thinking we were slaves, we were freed by white people, and we've been struggling ever since. And there's so much more to the story than that. It shows that this church was founded in 1872 
That's just seven years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Wow. And black folks were building churches and setting up order and charters, which meant that ingenuity was always there. It just wasn't channeled. Hey, cuz, how you doing? <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> how you, we we going to be in to speak before we leave. Okay, yeah, fine. yeah. Do. Okay. One of my relatives here from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, bring him in. Let's be, okay. I'm All doing right. well, ma'am. How you doing? <laughs> David, this is, is this Henderson right here? He was born in 1847. And he died in 1916. And uh, Amanda G. Yeah, this, this, is, this is our great, great grandmother. Uh, she was married to Henderson. Of all these plots, I don't think anything's older than this one. But it all started, these folks are all descendants of, of this couple. This is the gravestone of Henderson G. Um, he's the son of, of Reuben G. But more importantly, um, this is where this is this is the introduction to the black lineage of the G family. Right. Correct. Yep. And so, and and we're descendants of him. So, our great grandfathers were brothers. It's not just that Henderson is my great great grandfather. It's that he was half black and half Welsh. So he's the beginning of the G's who look like me. Until this gentleman, all the G's were Welsh. Um, the ones in the states were Welsh, and you know, they owned land and um, plantations in this area. But he was the guy who's the result of, um, of a rape. I'm proud to be Henderson's great great grandson. When, when I look back at history, when I, when I walked through that plantation, when I walked through what, what remained of that G home, I don't focus mainly on what white people did to us. I focused on who we became in spite of that. And was I a part of that? Did you, did you see me? Did you think this is my reality, but one day my great, great grandkids can change the world? And was I part of his motivation? Because knowing how I think about my lineage and how my mother thought about it, and how my grandmother used to pray for her children's children's children, I can't believe that he didn't endure those harsh realities so that I could have a documentary, run a business, own a home, have a passport, vote, write books. Um, that's what I'm proud of. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that a person who was considered three-fifths of a person in America had the audacity to think that there would be a piece of the American dream for his kids. That's who's great? My grandparents, you know, on my dad's side. Oh, sure. Like, look, this, like, this is Willie G. And, um, you know, he's a private in the U.S. Army, World War I. You know, so being, you know, patriotic is not new to my family, that we serve this country. That gives me a right to call it back to what it's supposed to be or to call it to what it's supposed to be. But this guy believed enough in America that he could make a difference, that he defended it with his life. His children and grandchildren should be able to remind America of this without feeling like we're dishonoring veterans. If I, don't, if I don't speak against injustice, then that's an injustice against this gentleman and what he fought for. I never thought that being in Leake County, Mississippi would be a place where I would feel a connection to the people, to the land, to the culture. The heat still takes some getting used to, but um, I'm having trouble finding the words to really explain this, the sense of peace and connection that, that I experience. This process causes me to, um, to feel conflicted. The conflict comes in that I've got to be able to say what Henderson's grandkids have and great grandkids have accomplished without becoming sold out so that I'm not allowed to say, but for the brothers and sisters who are lost in the cause and who are trapped in the cogs of social injustice, um, there's hope. Um, if my success silences my voice so that I can't speak up for those folks, then I'm not successful. But if I've become so entrenched in naming the systemic realities that I don't buy property and I don't send my kids to these white, unjust, racist universities, then I lose the ability to help her navigate a white male dominated world.
Now you'll take a left at the next, at the next uh, roadway. You know, this trip, the relationships that I'm building, they're all a reminder that um, history isn't ancient, not in this country. Not when your country's only a couple of hundred years old. This isn't ancient history. And that decisions that were made in rural Mississippi have an impact on people today. The trip has reminded us that um, the U.S. government was complicit in helping white settlers from Europe um, acquire land and wealth in order to amass slaves and to create cotton crops and sugar crops and things that they've done. Um, and the fact that I'm a product of that transaction makes me feel or sound like a commodity will hopefully become sort of a wake-up call for America to realize that's not something that happened a million years ago. If you know black people, you know people who are product of similar transactions. We can't go back in time and fix things, but we can acknowledge that some of what was created still exists and it's having an impact on mass incarceration or special education or underemployment or hopelessness or depression, health disparities. I would love to put some type of center, um, some kind of space where the G home, the G plantation was. That would be a place where thought leaders who want to wrestle with issues of race and diversity and inclusion could come and think. But a place that's actually on a piece of land in a community where we know lynching took place, slavery took place, being able to redeem a small parcel for the sake of training religious, corporate, philanthropic leaders to talk about this critical juncture at which we find ourselves and how we move ahead and why, what's at risk, would be, um, would be a tremendous legacy for Henderson. Uh, Standing on that land where here. Reuben lived, Venus lived, and Henderson lived, and trying to get into their mind, of their, their frame of thinking was a powerful exercise. And I didn't leave with a sense of despair. I left with a sense of hope and strength that they had. It inspired me to realize that if I'm getting on people's nerves and if I'm stepping on toes for the sake of um, a better community, a healthier community, so be it. There's no way you can reach true equality in the world to make everybody happy. And so do I want equality or do I want friendship? And if I go about equality in a way um, that requires character and integrity, then I'll get respect. But I think what happened for me on the trip is that I realized this is something that I've got to double down on and not worry about what people think about my anger or my choice of words, or my approach. I know I love this community, I know I love this country, which means I have the right to challenge it and to be a critic of it if I'm also part of the solution. And I'm not gonna be shy about that. I want to be key um, to people thinking differently about their role as American citizens. And let's make ourselves a true world power where everyone has access, because that's when we're gonna be stronger. If we are who we are now and we're limping, imagine if everyone has access to resources and leadership and change. Um, we can really become who we're supposed to be in the world or who we really can be.